Um, so this project revolves around Holy Trinity Church, now renamed the Cloudsley Centre. Uh, here is um, an original image of it when it was newly built and it is located in Cloudsley Square in Islington. So it was completed in 1829 and designed by Sir Charles Barry, who is now famous um, for being known as the architect uh, for the Houses of Parliament. So this is one of his early works when he was a young architect. And as such, uh, you can see one or two um, interesting design failures and also design quirks in the building, which are really interesting. Um, it's currently grade two star listed and it's on the Historic England uh, Heritage at Risk Register as category A. So it's in extremely poor condition. Um, one of the turrets was hit by lightning and um, it will need to be completely rebuilt. Um, we've just, and are in the process of re-roofing both the aisle roofs, which were in danger of immediate collapse. Um, and the stonework is in is very eroded and in poor repair. And obviously, all the M and E and services will will need to be refurbished so and replaced. So there is a lot of work to be done to this building. Um, we have taken it step by step. We've done a feasibility study to look at potential options, which was funded by the Architectural Heritage Fund, and um, we are looking at. Uh, fundraising for a major capital project over the next couple of years and um, we originally approached the uh, heritage fund to say could be put in an application for um, uh, a major grant and their response was that we needed to work up a community-based program in the first instance to understand who our partners were and how we could help the local community um, with this project and that is really where the Tales from the Crypt project was born. So it is a, um, a heritage project based around the stories of the people um, who have used and worshipped and are now buried in the crypt in the building. Here's some photographs, here's one of our volunteers on the left and you can see an internal shot of uh, the building and this is an earlier building um, a photograph of an external shot of the West End and uh, which actually now has scaffolding up in the West End to protect the turrets. Here's another internal shot as you can see the building is um, in poor condition internally and you'll see there's the netting protecting people um, from falling plaster from the nave ceiling which also is in a very poor state. And that was caused by water ingress before the nave roof was repaired. Um, so uh, a group of us got together when we had received the advice from uh, the Heritage Fund. And um, obviously the key driver was Kevin Rogers, who is head of property at the Diocese of London and um, he pulled together a team and we worked together to try and understand and scope out how the project could be developed to the benefit of the local community. And as such, we had on board Rebecca uh, Preston, who is a research historian at Two Spoken Workshop One. Susan was the volunteer coordinator and will be speaking in this workshop. I was the project manager. Um, Laura helped deliver the uh, um, and oversee the art workshops with um, New River College, which is the primary school just located off the square. Um, and Chris has been one of our volunteers and also our designer for the project. So it's been a really good team. And some of our local partners have also included Islington Guided Walks, Islington Society, um, Islington Museum and History Centre, where we were originally going to display the exhibition, and I'll just touch on that a little bit later, and as mentioned, New River College, the primary school. So the project outputs um, are a significant piece of research into the history of the building. We recruited um, in the region of 25 volunteers who have had 
I think, a really good time um, researching the history of the people buried in the crypt. And that was between 1829 and 1854, because after that, burials in crypts um, were no longer allowed by law. We have developed um, two guided walks around um, the local area, which picks up the stories of the people who are buried in the crypt and key um, uh, hi history facts. And we're also doing three public talks. We've done the first one. We've got two more, one in October and one in November. And this is all publicized on the Diocese of London's website. We were also supported by a number of volunteers who helped us actually then turn the stories received from the research into a exhibition at Islington Museum. And um, sadly, this obviously had to be shut down due to COVID-19. And the exhibition has now relocated to the Clancy Centre and is manned by volunteers on Saturdays. Um, and that will be open then on Saturday mornings through till um, the 28th of November. Um, we also then supported and worked with um, actually up to 24 pupils from New River College um, who participated in art workshops over three months. So it was the entire sort of September to December winter term. One part of the project that won't be going ahead is the pull up banners. Um, sadly because a number of the libraries in Islington have not yet reopened and also because uh, in terms of COVID um, they don't really want to be transporting banners from A to B. Um, but that's the only part of the project that has been impacted uh, significantly by COVID. And all the research findings um, and uh, all the presentations, as I said, will be on the Diocese of London website. So we've wor worked through a number of the outcomes um, that we wanted to achieve um, to, to support our heritage funding application. Um, and in terms of heritage will be better managed, we incorporated Rebecca's research into our conservation management plan. Um, heritage will be better interpreted and explained. We have um, undertaken the volunteer research and that has been uh, basically publicized in the exhibition and is also available to read. Um, Again, we're uploading the documents on the website. We had, as part of the volunteers um, researching, we delivered training in uh, researching and curating. Um, and we also uh, trained the pupils in art at New River College School. We had um, 35 plus volunteers com contributing their time. And again, this will be uh, considerably more because they're now manning the exhibition. Um, hopefully people will have an enjoyable experience in terms of undertaking the research process, going on the walks and uh, listening to the talks. Um, and a, definitely a wider range of people have been engaged in heritage and that's um, delivered through our work with New River College. And hopefully in the longer term, um, uh, the area will be much better because we will have refurbished the building, but in the short term, obviously through the walks, everybody will um, hopefully be able to um, enjoy a uh, more interest in the local area through understanding more about its history. So here's another photo of our volunteers. Um, and uh, here is a photo of some of the pupils at New River College and some of the work that was created. So in terms of the actual project itself, um, we spent quite a lot of time consulting with the wider community to understand what the need was in, in the area. Um, we then submitted a project inquiry form to the Heritage Fund. And once we'd received a positive response to put an application in for um, a, a heritage grant, um, it then took us about two to three months to develop and submit the application. We received um, an award letter six weeks later um, and it took us a couple of months to secure permission to start and um, 
I would say that there was an 18 month delivery program, but that has extended a little bit due to COVID, which pushed all the delivery of the workshops and the activities from the spring um, out to the autumn this year. So the total time frame is sort of two and a half, three years to deliver this project. In terms of the budget, um, the total project costs are in the region of 58,000. We secured the uh, Heritage Fund grant of uh, 46,700, which was absolutely fantastic and helped the project to um, proceed. Um, the diocese put in match funding of 6,300 and we secured a culture seeds grant for the art workshops from the Mayor of London of 5,000 pounds. And that managed to pull together all the funding we needed. So hopefully that's a quick introduction to um, the project and um, we can uh, take any questions and answers or other questions and I'll try and do answers. Uh, David, do you want to unmute? Yes, yeah, I have done. Um, I, I was gonna, a few really, um, but just one of, one of the first ones is just, uh, this is obviously a community-based heritage project. It doesn't involve the repairs of the church. No. And I just, and I just wondered how you think this may impact on developing an application to cover the repairs to, to the lottery. You know, I suppose one concern would be that you've done all the community stuff up front and then you'd have to do more community stuff to satisfy the National Lottery with a, a, a bigger repairs-based application. Well, um, um, obviously, um, we are hoping that we will be able to um, speak to the lottery and um, put in an application for a capital grant at some point next year. Um, that will uh, include a, a sort of our next stage of community programme as well. Um, not least because, I, I mean, doing this piece of work has been it's been such fun. I can't tell you how enjoyable it's been and hopefully um, I think everybody who's participated has learned a lot and enjoyed it. Um, so, you know, we're already having thoughts about well, what is the next step. So we have, we've basically done the history of the project to um, 1854 when um, burials were shut, but we're looking forward now to, to doing the rest of the history up to today, if we can, as part of um, a larger capital project. And the two very much tie hand in hand, and we'll make it a better project for it. So I, I don't have a problem about that. I would want to, to develop them hand in hand. Okay, thank you. I've got other questions, but I'll let other people have a go. Okay. Um, okay. Well, I can see Linda and Anna. So how about Linda, you go first, then Anna. Hi. Um, it was just a quick question about the training. You said you, you trained your volunteers. Did you do that in-house or is there somewhere? So if I was recruiting volunteers, where could I look for training for them? Well, I'll let Susan answer that question because she delivered that element. Hi there, Linda. Um, just in a nutshell, because I will come on to this a little bit in my presentation, but essentially it's uh, two of the project partners, uh, Islington Archives and Is Islington Museum, that had uh, delivered the formal training for the volunteers in how to do research and how to curate an exhibition. And my role as project, as volunteer coordinator, was to support them with more informal training as to how to actually turn that into reality um, and sort of mentor them on the way. So we had a blended approach to training, but that's a really good point about, um, I hope I will come on to, is how to identify a really good project partner to deliver that training, because I think it brings great strength and great richness. So is that okay for a short answer for now? Yes, thank you. Um, Anna, do you want to? Thank you. Um, what was happening in the church before you started? Was it, was there a congregation? Was it a typical church with uh, so was it just an, a blank sheet for you to, to work with 
Yes, so uh, it's a closed church um, and it's no longer used for Anglican worship and um, the previous tenants uh, left the building in 2017. Um, so that's, uh, as a closed church, it then falls onto the diocese as their responsibility to repair it and reuse it. Um, hence, they've picked this project up. Are there any other questions? Ah, uh, Tessa. Um, I, I recall you saying, and I know it's come up um, in my experience as well, that the Heritage Lottery is quite keen for organisations to do smaller activity projects before launching into a, a big capital bid. I mean, have you, um, from your experience of the project and feedback from them, do you feel that that is something that, that the project is, is going to help with, if you like, a, a, a building block for the next? Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Next it is, it, it, it is, it is a very important building block. Um, and, and I mean, there's all sorts of reasons. No, I don't really want to step on Joe's toes here, but um, there's all sorts of reasons why they might ask you to do that, not least because it helps you develop a much better understanding of your community and the need in the community and who you might work with and support. Um, but also it introduces you to the, um, the Heritage Fund, its systems, uh, can you deliver a project? Can you, um, you know, can you deliver the outcome? So it's a sort of starter to, to get you used to bigger projects. And some people might have experience with that, but other organisations don't. So, um, you know, generally, I'd say it's a very useful first step to any project. Thanks. So... Becky, can you see if we've got any more questions? No, I can't see any more. Okay, smashing. Well, in which case, I'm going to move on to um, art and heritage next. Now, they couldn't um, join us, so they've actually pre-recorded their presentation. So I am now going to try and play it. Um, within their presentation, they had a little film clip. And I'm afraid my ability to... I suspect my ability to play the presentation, to stop it at the right moment, play the film clip, and then start the presentation again is probably beyond me. So you'll have to excuse me. My plan is to play the presentation and then to play the film clip. So hopefully that's okay and hopefully that will work. Um, so bear with me and I'm going to just start screen sharing again. Um... Right, can everybody see Arts and Heritage edited? If I play. So hello everyone, we're Arts and Heritage. I'm Steph Allen, I'm the Exec Director of Arts and Heritage. And I'm Judith King, I'm the Creative Director of Arts and Heritage. So we're recording this for the first time, so excuse us if we get a bit wrong and fumble along the way. Uh, I'm currently sat in a newly redecorated bedroom in Hereford. Uh, and I'm actually in my mother's house in northwest London. Um, I'm usually based in Hexham, Northumberland, where Arts and Heritage's main offices are. Um, although we do projects nationally. So what we're going to do is tell you a bit about us as an organisation and what we do. Uh, give some examples of why heritage organisations work with artists and why artists work with heritage organisations. And then show you a couple of case studies of projects that we've worked on. So hopefully this will work if I share my screen and we'll show you a set of slides. There we go, that's better. Great. 
Okay, so this is us. Um, a bit about what we do and who we are. I'll try and move us so we're not covering the text all the time. Uh, so we work forging collaborations between heritage sites and artists uh, to try and tell stories in different ways, create new perspectives and let artists find new ways into the stories that you're trying to tell. Uh, so bringing to life narratives, atmosphere and architecture of histories and places. Uh, what we really want to do is show that by putting contemporary art in those scenarios, you can bring in other audiences, but also tell alternative stories and things that connect to different people in different ways. We also support the heritage sector uh, through skills and development and peer-to-peer -peer learning, and we have created a curatorial forum as well for curators working in the sector. So, uh, funding and history. Way back uh, in 2009, I uh, established Arts and Heritage. I had had a long experience, over 20 years experience, of um, persuading the heritage sector to use artists, contemporary artists, within their organisations and their heritage sites, um, aligning themselves to really the audience um, development strategies of, of, of getting more audiences into their sites. So we've been going for over 10 years. We're going to have a, a celebration next year. Um, Arts and Heritage was initially two people. It's now expanded and we are now a, a national portfolio, portfolio organisation set to support, funded by the Arts Council England. Uh, we applied um, before the NPO um, funding for a programme called uh, Meeting Point through the New Zealand Resilience Fund, which Steph will tell you about in due course. Um, we have worked um, with a great deal of partners, obviously the big um, uh, heritage partners, National Trust, English Heritage, Churches Conservation Trust, local authorities, independent museums, cathedrals, and um, some also other religious uh, organisations, which we'll tell you about, and uh, latterly, the universities. So we've worked with a lot of partners, and now the, the team that was two is now um, expanded to four. Four, I nearly said five. Well, we've got a few freelance producers as well, so I think we're up to five now. Yeah, so we're, we're ex we've expanded and we've got a great deal of experience between, the, between all of us, between the team. Uh, so the different strands of activity we do, we do consultancy, so help other heritage organisations with strategy and programming and skills development so that we're giving the skills to others to do the commissioning work. We do training both for artists and for museums and heritage staff. Uh, artists to support them in approaching heritage sites and museums, helping them make work and telling them what the heritage organisations expect, what they need them to do and why they're programming work. And for the heritage staff and museum staff, often with small and medium scale museums and sites, to upskill them and give them the confidence to be able to programme artists. Uh, we advocate for working in heritage sites quite a lot and advocate for artists to be placed in those spaces and create networks to support everyone working in those sectors. As Judith said, we have a national delivery programme uh, called Meeting Point. Meeting Point is developed to, it's funded by Arts Council to support the skills development of small to medium scale museums. So what we do is running, run a, an action learning programme where we work with curators and engagement officers and managers and site managers um, and sort of support them in developing the skills they need to commission artworks, helping them write a brief, helping them work out what they want the artist to do, the type of project they want, when they want it to take place, and what they want it to achieve. Why are they working with artists and what is the reason they're working with them and the story they're trying to tell? So we've got a couple of case studies of meeting point projects that Judith's going to talk to you about. Yes, thanks Steph. So um, we started in, in 2015 working with museums and at the end of our, our programme, I think, uh, in, in 2022 perhaps, we will have worked with over 40 modest and medium-sized museums who, who apply to this program because um, they, need, they want to know how to commission artists, where to find artists, um, how do you find them, 
how do you write the brief, as Steph has said, you know, all of those processes of working with artists, what's the relationship that you have with them? And uh, these museums come to us for various reasons. One of the museums that applied to uh, our programme was the Bronte Parsonage Museum, who actually had worked with, um, with contemporary artists before, uh, but wanted to really address the issue of the local audience not coming in to their, uh, to their place and make it, embedding it more within the community. Um, so that was the brief really. We work with museums listening to why they want to commission artists. You know, what, what do they, what, what is the reason? What do they want to achieve? And this was coming out very strongly from the Bronte Parsonage Museum that the, it was the local audience. So a textile artist who had never ever done a, uh, work in the landscape before came through, Lynn Setterington, and she worked with uh, the local community and a community in Bradford with refugees to, to visit uh, the Bronte Parsonage Museum and to stitch their own uh, names into this very, very long tape, which you see now embedded into the, uh, the moors around Haworth, where the Brontes lived. And these are the pseudonyms of the Bronte sisters, Curra Bell, Acton Bell and Ellis Bell which is actually the, the writing that you're seeing, which is embedded into the moors, is this very, very long in, uh, tape, as I found it, and sort of almost like a textile tape, which has got the, the, the signatures of the community and the people that Lynn worked with. It's a very poignant piece. It means that everybody's names are coming together and being embedded within the moors. A very beautiful piece. And actually can be seen by all the communities because that's quite high up in the landscape, isn't it? So it is. It was putting people piece. back into that story yeah. that yeah. was sort of being overtaken by the tourist industry of actually these are real people living in Howard in yeah. that environment that sort of re-engage with the museum and what they're doing. Like, they yeah. seem to have gone very pale there. <laughs> um, another project that we were just about to demonstrate was uh, Cheetons Library in Manchester. Uh, shall I talk about this one, Julie? Yes, do. Um, so this is Cheetons Library in Manchester, a really old library that no one really knew about. So it's been there a very long time um, and has had many famous uh, writers. Was there Karl Marx used to go and research there? Yes. And John Dee were two of the famous ones that they, they had. But very atmospheric library. And we brought in brass art because they wanted something that was quite magical artists that would kind of play up on the atmosphere that was in there that attracts a totally new audience to come and explore what they do. And Brass Art made these beautiful um, structures that were hidden uh, down, down the side of alleys where books were, alleys, whatever, <laughs> the aisles where books were kept. Um, and based on the images of hands that they found in the books find where people had marked certain things like olden day post-it notes essentially, where people had marked chapters and verses in these old books and they created a set of installations with hands and had a magical event with potions and drinks and the art crowd coming in and exploring this amazing space. Yeah, it's a beautiful piece. So why should or do Heritage Show Programme Contemporary Art? Um, I mean, for me, it's about bringing in new perspectives and new ideas and new visions so that they can, you bring in someone who isn't familiar with the story you're constantly telling and someone who might actually look at it from a completely different angle. Uh, what do you think, Judith? For the heritage sites, uh, uh, yeah, they, they, they kind of, they're thinking about their audience. Um, there are obviously issues that they, um, that, that the heritage sites sort of come with, is, which is increasing audience. A lot of the time it's, it's aligned to the business case. But it is um, various other um, reasons why they do it. And it's about raising their profile. Uh, and it's about embedding it within the local community. It's about repeat visits. It's about increased depth of engagement. These are, I have to say that all of these things that you've seen on the screen now are um, things that the heritage and the museum sector have told us why they should program uh, artists within there. So it's about using artists in a different way to support audience development strategies. And, and of course, it's about um, revealing history in, in very, very different ways for, 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 for all people. 
So it has a, a, a it really does um, embed itself into the way that the museum or the heritage society is looking is looking at presenting its history. And I guess the same goes for artists as well. I mean, why artists find heritage sites so interesting, and why we focused on artists is, I guess, their ability to get under the skin, to research, to tell stories, to to have access to the information that all these heritage sites have and museums have, and the specialist knowledge and expertise and helps artists to develop new work and new ideas and go in different directions. Yes, and, and we mustn't forget that artists are so are hungry for this sort of research for, the, for, for their own work, but also to make new work for an audience as well. So they, the, the museums and the heritage sites have have really a, a rich foundation upon which a new way of presenting history can be made. It's a, it's a, it's a real opportunity for them um, to, to raise their profile as well, but to make new work in a different, and also in a different audience. Because we must, um, I think Steph, you'll agree with me, Arts and Heritage, we're not gallery curators. This, not, this is not where we are. We go outside of the gallery and we are working with organisations whose audience might not it primarily think of going to see contemporary art, but it's embedded within a, a historical context, which is really interesting. Absolutely, and I think taking that work out there and taking it outside galleries removes a barrier some people have about exploring contemporary art and what it does, because they don't have to walk through a gallery door, they're going to a familiar surrounding or a surrounding that they're used to stepping through but have new ideas placed there for them to explore. Yeah. And um, so we're going to go through a couple of case studies, particularly ones that have been based in ecclesiastical or church environments. Judith, first we're going to look at Matt Stokes and Gog Magog. Yes, I'll try and rattle through this quickly because it's a, it was a very, it was quite a complicated um, project, but really good. It was a, a Newcastle University Arts and Heritage and other partners um, a research project, one of which the partners was the Church's Conservation Trust, and Holy Trinity Church in Sunderland uh, is, as you can see, it's a very sort of grand, or this photograph makes it look like a very grand church, really sort of stranded within um, new social housing and an area that had been redeveloped over centuries. But Holy Trinity Church stood proud amongst the change of history. Uh, the brief to the artist, Max Stokes, was to actually bring in the community and to make a piece of work that reflected upon the history of Holy Trinity Church as it went through from the 1700s up till uh, the present day. But a, a piece of work that, that could, could kind of tell that history in a different way, but also involve the community in the making of that work too. So artist Matt Stokes was brought in um, and he researched the history of Holy Trinity Church and that area of, of Sunderland and worked with two local musicians to create um, a new piece of music, really, a, a contemporary piece of music with two composers. He collaborated, that's his practice, he collaborates with people. So he's actually making a new piece of work, a new sung choral work with local choirs as well. So the resulting work was, was, was as you can see, through, um, presented through these speakers. But the starting point was for the work was actually the bells within Holy Trinity Church that were now silent. And so it, you can see the voice of Gog Magog, the voices of the bells, this is something that Matt picked up as he was doing his site visit to Holy Trinity Church. Is the, pe the bells were silent and there was a very famous bell peal that he, had, he sort of took as his starting point. So the work, which was 45 minutes long, was a choral work that was a contemporary work but actually told the history of Holy Trinity Church from the vestry men who used to have their dinners within Holy Trinity Church and give out the alms to the poor, to the advance of cholera, which came through from Sunderland, through the ports of Sunderland, through to um, housing that had now disappeared, deprivation, and then recent 1960s housing 
uh, of social housing and how that was embedded with the community. It was quite a, a, a rich and complicated project, but the result was a very, very beautiful, poignant piece of work. When you walked into that church, which was empty, you could hear this absolute, this beautiful um, choral piece that really resonated with you and brought the community in. They had been involved in it, in the making of it, and so they came in and wanted to listen to it. It also made this silent church um, alive again with music that you could hear from the outside. It was a very beautiful piece of work. I seem to remember when we went to go see it, it was also hard hats that you had to put on when you went in because they were rebuilding the church. So you also had that feeling of being part of that rebuild and that experience, which was quite theatrical in itself, as well as the piece sat there in the middle of the room. There's a, a, there's a very good film on the resources uh, link that Steph will show you where I really, um, you know, uh, I say that you ought to have a listen to that because it's, it's a really good description of how the, ch the, 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 the journey of that piece of work came about. Really good. Uh, so Usher, Judith, you're going to talk about Usher College next. I am, right. Usher College is uh, based outside Durham. Uh, a former Catholic seminary, an extraordinary place, like a town. Um, and within it is this Pugin designed chapel. Usher, the seminary closed in the 1970s and Usher wanted to um, develop a contemporary program within, within the, the now abandoned site. And when I first went there, uh, I was struck by the absence of people within uh, within the site itself and especially within the chapel that actually was being used every Sunday <clears throat> and also for uh, music events. But there was a real sort of silence and, and as I say, uh, an absence of people. Uh, the American artist who's a really well-known artist, Chuck Close, does really hyper-realistic uh, paintings, drawings and tapestries. Now, the image that you're seeing here are actually tapestries. They are not photographs, they are tapestries uh, of people um, that, he, that the artist knows. And actually, I think right at the end, you'll see that's a self-portrait of the artist uh, uh, with the glasses on. But by bringing these enormous tapestries into the chapel, it gave a sense of a contemporary congregation there. These are the people now that were in the chapel. Um, Usher had never uh, put contemporary work within their place before, and they were really struck by this piece of work. It, it, it rendered people, uh, you know, speechless, and, and they got quite emotional when these tapestries went, went up. So this was actually negotiated with the Chuck Coe studio, so we borrowed them. We borrowed these works rather than created new ones, but it was a very beautiful piece of work. It's now been the start of working with them on a series of projects that we've now worked alongside them to commission and put in the spaces. And I think the next image that you're going to see, I think, is of an artist called Matt Collishaw. So following the Chuck Close uh, borrowed works within the chapel, uh, the Usher decided to commission a new piece of work from an artist called Matt Collishaw, who did a lot of research uh, uh, in the library of Usher, which has got a beautiful library, but a bit like Cheatham's. Came across a book by William Allen, which was annotated by Richard Topcliffe, who was a chief priest hunter and torturer um, during, uh, during the Reformation. And um, he, the work that he that Matt Collishaw explored was really reflecting upon the themes of martyrdom and treason, worship and heresy. Within the chapel was a Pugin eagle, which you can see on the right hand side. Usher decided, to, uh, Matt wanted the, this out to be brought from the, the chapel to outside the chapel, which the, the um, Usher agreed to do so. So you see the original Pugin Eagle on the right hand side and the new piece of work, the, the, the contemporary piece of work on the left hand side by Matt Collishaw is actually um, an automated piece, uh, an, an, an automata that is the Eagle stripped down of all its embellishments. So it's stripped down to its real sort of bare mechanics. Um, 
uh, and it's stripped of the embellishment. So it, it, it actually the work reflects upon two opposing views of Christianity following the Reformation, the Protestant, the Catholic, the victim, the aggressor. This piece of work that you see here is a, it's a chilling piece of work, actually. When you go up to it, um, you see it moving and it, it, it really does. It's a very powerful piece of work in response to the research that he'd done within the, within the, the college. So hopefully we've covered a few basics. You'll see from that that Arts Council England were a major funder in that work. Um, funding is a big part of why people participate in contemporary programmes and finding the right funding to, part, to commission artists. Arts Council's website is always a really good one to start with because it gives project funding and overviews of what they will fund and how they will fund it. What I've also done in this slide is share with you some examples of other things and resources that, you, that might help. So we have a, a, big, a longer film of Gog Magog, um, Mapping Contemporary Art in the Heritage Experience. Judith, do you want to say a couple of minutes about that? Yeah, so that was a major um, research project with Newcastle University. I think I, I sort of mentioned it earlier. Um, and it was looking at uh, why uh, the, the benefits, are, I think, of, of why heritage organisations should and do uh, commission artists for their sites. So there are case studies on that website. Um, there's a lot of information um, about how the research project, what the findings of the research project and the, the commissions that would, took place. So I do recommend you have a look at that, uh, that, that website. It's got a lot of information on it. And of course, our own website has lots of case studies, examples and films, um, which will help you contextualise why people do it, look at examples of conversations with curators and artists about projects that have already happened, um, to give you more insight so we can share those details with you. But I think that's all from us, Judith. Yeah, no, that, that's fine. I uh, wish, wish we could have been there in person, but of course we can't. So. Hope that hopefully this has been the next best thing. Indeed. Thank you very much for asking us. Okay, bye bye for now. Bye. Okay, so um, that was a presentation from Arts and Heritage. Uh, hopefully you found that um, really interesting and uh, giving you some suggestions and ideas. Um, I'm just going to try and run the film now and um, which should accompany the presentation. I came to Usha College about a year ago to have a look around and try and figure out a way of making it work that resonated with the chapels and the whole environment. And there were two things that interested me. One was the Puget lectern, this magnificent eagle. And the second was a book written by William Allen, which had annotations by a character called Richard Topcliffe. And I come across Topcliffe before reading a book on the murder of Christopher Marlowe and the Elizabethan spy network. And he was described as being Elizabeth the First's top priest hunter and torturer. He was responsible for whippings and mutilations and the rack, an altogether sadistic, evil man. Topcliffe was part of the machinery of Elizabethan state security. And in this book, this one document, you had a plea by William Allen for the Protestants to stop persecuting, torturing and executing Catholics. And then this annotation by Topcliffe, the torturer, saying that this was all nonsense. So you had these two opposing sides of this conflict between the Catholic and Protestant religion and all happening on this one page of the document. So I wanted to build some kind of work around this, around this duality, this opposition. And I came back to the eagle designed by Pugin 
and thought maybe we can use this emblem, this kind of symbol of religion, of, of dissipation of, of God's word around the world. So I decided I wanted to incorporate Pugin's eagle in the work that I was making as part of the installation and to make a mirror image of that golden structure. And I thought if I stripped away all the grandiosity, took away the gold and the feathers and all the embellishments and took it back to its raw skeleton. So you saw it more like a kind of a, a, a cold mechanical machine, something that was designed to do a job. And in this case, it was the job of persecution, torture, mutilation, killing. So this eagle became this kind of cold, calculated, silver, steel killing machine. So basically I took the skeleton of the eagle and then we started to build like an armature which could be operated mechanically so we could run it on 13 different servo motors to animate it and to have it raising its wings, looking around, lifting its claw and just looking like a predatory beast while facing this other golden eagle of Augustus Pugin. We'd been making the eagle in the workshop for months and it was looking interesting and it was looking quite good um, but it's only really when you bring it here that it has um, the, the, the power brought to it by this backdrop, this kind of crucible of religious belief and when you witness it against these kind of highly ornate and uh, very richly embellished surfaces, it takes on different meaning, it adopts this kind of mantle of the sacred and there's, there's something about that that gives the work a charge. Where do I stand on it? I don't think I'm going to touch on whether I am a believer or not. Um, I'm interested in all the trappings of religion. Uh, you can have your relationship with God, but the church itself is this organization that adopts a lot of rituals, and a lot of visual iconography in order to dress up and ordain this, this belief. I'm quite curious to know how important these embellishments are and what it means when you strip them all away and can your faith still survive without all, all of the trappings and all of the, uh, the other elements that, that come with the religion. Okay, um, well, gosh, that was, uh, I hadn't actually previewed that, so that was um, quite something. Um, may I suggest, because we are slightly over time, that if you have any questions on that particular section of the presentation, um, that you email Becky with them and we can forward them on and get a reply direct. Would, would that sound okay? Um, and, and then, uh, yeah, because otherwise, you know, with them not being present, I think it's, it's, you know, it's probably, that's the easiest way to, to move forward. Um, so if I could now welcome Susan, who has briefly spoken to you, who was the volunteer coordinator on the Tales from the Crypt project, and is now going to talk to you about um, communicating your heritage research. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Let me just find my slideshow. Okay. Right. Has everyone got it on screen? Could I just have a thumbs up, Becky? Lovely. Thank you. Okay. Now, apologies. I've actually amplified my title because I think they're analyzing what we did in terms of um, partnerships 
and also communicating knowledge. I thought there were actually three aspects to this. Um, so I've called it building partnerships, sharing knowledge and engaging audiences. And I think it's actually quite hard to splice these into three very neat little sections. Um, I've tried to in the context of this talk, but you'll see there's overlap. And I think that says a lot about the process of, of creating partnerships, but actually making them work on the ground. So this is very much um, a ground up view of my experience uh, and the volunteers' experience, uh, as well as the wider project experience of, of partnership working. So just a few pointers, I suppose, a few, a few things for us to, to get our heads around to begin with. Obviously, partnerships offer opportunities for two-way engagement. Um, it probably doesn't need saying, but I think there is sometimes, a, I'm thinking of other projects I've worked on, there's a sense of, oh, we can get them to do that bit, um, not realising that by bringing a project partner on board, they actually might change the project and might bring um, greater richness and depth to it. So it's the openness with which you approach and form those partnerships, I think is really, really valuable. And obviously, as I've put, they, they do not merely deliver project opportunities, they develop and enrich them and make them come alive. And this is the thing, I think it's um, the great project planning and discussions, early discussions to who to bring on board. You're not quite sure how that will evolve. It's, it's only the experience of delivering that you realize, oh, that was a really good, good move to bring them on board, but I didn't expect that outcome in the same way. So I just got some sort of top tips, which are probably terribly obvious to you all, but just identifying potential partners and starting to have those conversations. Now, I should make clear that it wasn't myself who had these conversations for the Tales of the Crypt um, project. This was identified by other members of the team. But I think, think local. We were very fortunate in having the New River College Primary School in literally in the corner of Cloudsley Square, immediately on the doorstep of the church. Um, do the project potential partners have time and staff resources to commit? And this is <laughs> the moment to have honest conversations. We were working within a very strict budget, uh, sorry, timeline and budget of um, initially of sort of a year long um, delivery of activities. So there couldn't be any postponement. Obviously, ironically, we've had postponement because of COVID, but that's a contingency factor. How can project partners' involvement shape the heritage activities um, and let, let them sort of, uh, their experience and their capacities shape how those are delivered? Will they help broaden participation in the project? Are we just looking at the same kind of audiences that they bring on board? Are they bringing a new, slightly different audience? And ultimately, how will their involvement strengthen the project? And I think that's something that uh, is really key to all this. It's, it's actually making a better project out of it all. So I've, <laughs> I've had a bit of a logo fest here. Um, obviously, these, there are the, Rosie's outlined the formal project partners, but I've thrown in some others because actually, when you're working with people, um, there may be a formal agreement, we will deliver this aspect. Obviously, art and Christianity, as Laurel will be talking about, there's a very clear role there. But I've also put in, um, you know, the, 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 the key people back us behind uh, this project, obviously the Heritage Lottery Fund, Rosie's been dealing with that with them. And finally, the Historic England grant that came in very late on, not part of the project, um, to do emergency repairs to the church, but that has enabled the delivery of the exhibition within the building. So that's, that's an interesting thing. So just keeping in mind on, this is how diverse it gets, which is rather wonderful. So this is just a simple iteration of who did what. Um, Islington Local History Centre, they supplied the research training, um, the archival archives and images that we used. Islington Museum provided the curatorial workshops for the volunteers, um, expertise on curation and obviously objects from their collection. Islington Guided Walks devised and delivered a series of guided walks. New River College Primary um, Pupil Referral Unit, they hosted a term of art workshops for their pupils. Art and Christianity, devised and delivered a term of workshops for the pupils. And then this is a bit of a wild card, which I'll come on to. Islington Education Library Service, they loaned costume and artifacts. They weren't in the original plan, and that sort of underlines the need for flexibility. And then 
formerly a member of the team, Chris Wells, our designer, but actually the way we worked with him was very much, uh, he was a key partner. And again, that two way process of helping shape um, the outputs and the outcomes, um, how they delivered. He, it was more than just the delivery, um, two way process there. Obviously the Islington Society who are kindly hosting the three project talks, lectures, uh, the lottery, Culture Seeds, the Mayor of London, obviously providing funding for the art workshops. And then finally, the volunteers. Um, I would say this is volunteer coordinated, but I think they are very much project partners. Their, their, their sort of collaboration individually and collectively in and belief in the project, as well as their delivery of the formal outcomes in terms of the research output or the exhibition, that is a really significant part of establishing partnerships. Because without them as the, the, the workforce, um, we wouldn't have anything to share. So we come on now to sharing knowledge. Um, and for those of you who uh, weren't able to tune into the first workshop, we just want to make clear the two aspects of this knowledge that we, we had to impart. Um, so on the one side, there was the work done by our um, teammate, uh, Rebecca Preston, on the story of Holy Trinity Church. So a chronology of the building right from the early, its early beginnings when it was um, planned and designed in the 1820s, right up to when it closed. Um, an extraordinary piece of detailed archival work with key dates, images, maps, you name it, a, a phenomenal resource. Um, and then the second part of this, the second strand, is of course the stories of the 100, 178 people who are buried in the crypt between the dates 1829 and 1854. Now, mm, almost a third of those were, were children and infants, quite hard to find much about some of those, but actually the volunteers who researched them, my goodness, they really unearthed some extraordinary stories. Um, and that's something that obviously we're sharing in the exhibition. And here's just one of the uh, monuments, few monuments that there are in the actual um, nave and aisles of the church to two, two sisters who both married the same man. Um, it's interesting picking up on the artist presentation we've just seen in that amazing film is um, the ability to be present in the building uh, was incredibly enriching for him. What we have, were grappling with is the absence. A, we couldn't get into the church to deliver any activities because it wasn't safe. And B, the people who we were investigating are buried underneath the church and only a handful have memorials. So it's the absences is, is quite a major theme of all of uh, our work. And I will be completely honest, a challenge. So the research findings, um, now I love research and I can get very obsessed as Rosie can testify into the details and minutiae of all the different lives that we investigated. But what is this? This is just data, isn't it? And I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've all been presented with a sort of data dump moment when somebody sends you a scary spreadsheet or something and all this information and it doesn't look pretty and it doesn't look usable. Um, and that was one of the biggest challenges for me right at the start, I think, one of our team interrogated and saying, well, how are you going to pass it on for all these other wonderful activities? How are you going to turn raw research into these 178 people, make it meaningful? So uh, there were several hooks and I'll just go through them very briefly. Um, the, 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 the slide, uh, the image to the right just tells us the bare bones of what we had. We had the burial number, the name, uh, the age at death and the place where that person was living. Now, that was enough for, um, to be able to carry out family history research and address research as to where they lived. And the hook was the place where they lived as well as their lives. And it's tying those two things together. Um, and we'll come on to that, how the walks used it. Um, but be able to expand that. On the left-hand side, there's just the format which our volunteers put their research into just a one page or two page summary of the people involved. And here's a perfect instance of a, a really um, heartbreaking story of four young children, all called, all christened William Hubbard, uh, the children of, um, same, of, of this family who lost four young people 
um, far too early and all four of them are buried in the crypt. So you can, you can see the, the angst and the anguish there. Um, and finding out who those people were, were and who the family were and where they lived was really, really, a, that was the motivation for us. So we've got this uh, information. I have to say what followed was an amazingly intense uh, conversation with our two artists, uh, Nir and Anna. Rebecca, myself and them, uh, the, the artists got together over a cup of coffee and later looked at images in Islington archives to give some visual themes, to work up some visual themes. Two things I wanted to point out here, we've got the silhouettes, a classic art form of the 1820s and 1830s. The idea we don't know much about these people, but we perhaps could imagine their silhouette. We have image silhouettes of the building, the church there and the surrounding houses. The monochrome really captured, I think, um, the, 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 the imagination of Nier in particular and also Anna and the paper marbling. This is from one of the books that we've been looking at, from one of the rape books in the archives to find out more about the people. But the, the texture of, of, of the book itself, that fit, fed into um, the artwork that we did with the pupils. And finally at the bottom, this wonderful chunky uh, print typeface from the 1830s, a, a really good visual cue. Uh, so I've put here creative conversations, how to adapt your research findings to suit a range of different audiences and activities. Now, of course, that's going to be incredibly, um, your approach will be changed according to the stories you're researching, the stories you wish to share. Um, for us, if I can just say a little bit about how I was going to share some of these stories uh, with the pupils. Now, they're all um, primary school age, mostly key stage two, but there were some as young as six, I believe, in the workshops. And we have quite dry documents. We only have one portrait of uh, one of the people we've investigated. Um, so Anna brilliantly told me about the Isl Islington Education Library Service. Um, which here it is in all its glory on the upstairs of the uh, Central Library in Islington. And they have a lending service, not just of costumes, which the children then were able to dress up in Victorian costumes, but also artifacts for them to be able to handle things. Because how do we connect children of 2019 with the children of the 1830s? We gave them quills, um, we looked at handwriting, how people learned to write then with um, pen and ink, we looked at uh, morning letters with the black borders, how people received the news that somebody had died. Um, we looked at horseshoes. We, looked, we wore a lot of hats. The session I went in, we had a, the hat game. We all wore different hats as well as in putting on different bits of costume. And that was my way in to start talking about some of the people to get them thinking. Things look different then. So here's my quiz for you because I suspect everyone is looking forward to the coffee break. I would love anyone to be able to tell me this in the chat afterwards, but this is the question I pose to the children. How does a handkerchief take a 20 year old man named William Cod Kidman to Australia in 1836? And I presented them with a handkerchief from the loans connection and uh, an old map of Australia. I'm sure you could work it out, but for them, it was a brilliant, brilliant guessing game and a discovery and a really fun way of making that story come alive. Other ways we sort of engaged uh, the pupils was, uh, for instance, the image of the canal up in the top hand corner. Um, one of the characters, Frederick Snee, was um, responsible for managing the Regent's Canal in Islington, as was his father for many years, a real dynasty, and here's a lovely image of some barges on the canal. At which one, when I was sharing this story, one of the children piped up and said, oh, do you remember Mr. So-and-so, one of their teachers, he lived on a canal boat, and obviously had shared the stories of what life was living like what life was like on a, living on a canal boat with his, his pupils. And there was a connection there and I didn't expect that. And that was really lovely and it made sense and it brought those two centuries almost, you know, they almost vanished. Um, in the bottom, we've got Chris Wells, our designers, uh, reimagining of the silhouettes that we use, were, were, were created by the artists. I'm sure Laura will come on to that. I just wanted to point out the marbling that was used in the background that went on the panels. And then on the right, here's an image of um, some of the children's artwork, the light boxes in the foreground with the conventional exhibition panels in, in behind. And the two were to be displayed together. So the, the curatorial volunteers created um, the panels and that would be shown alongside the artwork. 
Now this was, <laughs> this was exhibition one in the museum and archives space. So that's how it looked then. Now, you remember I talked about the addresses. How do we um, tell stories about these people? Um, and one of the ways, of course, was to pass on this knowledge to Islington Guided Walks, who are going to create uh, and curate, indeed, uh, a guided walk, which they're now delivering um, uh, most weeks uh, in Islington. So they would go visit key places where some of these individuals lived and tell the stories of them and their families and their work. And I thought I'd include this lovely image of, um, on the right hand side of the parish school that was set up in 1830 um, as a sort of comparison to the school building that New River College now inhabits. But that the infant school was on, is on the guided walk as well. And then COVID struck, the museum and archives had to close. The exhibition lasted, I think all of a day and a half. Time passes, but luckily, and this is where Historic England, not formally part of this whole uh, wonderful project planned out um, some time ago, the fact that they were able to um, fund the repairs to the North Isle roof, the builders were able to complete the work, meant that the exhibition and the artwork had a new home post lockdown. Um, and the scaffolding has even gone now. On the, on the left, there's a picture of myself and two of my uh, school volunteers on day one of opening up um, the exhibition. It's very exciting. And then outside, we've got Islington Guided Walks leading their first walk. Now, none of this really was possible in the first iteration of the project because the church was going to remain closed. But the fact that we've been able to knit the two elements, well, more than two elements together has been terribly good. I mean, what has been so lovely for the two Saturdays that the exhibition has been running inside the building has, has meant we managed to grab passers-by, come and have a look at the building and find out about the exhibition. And frankly, that was not really an audience that we thought we were going to capture very easily. So that flexibility is a wonderful thing. So here we go, shameless plug for the exhibition and some images of uh, visitors engaging with it. And that is, I suppose, I've touched on the different audiences that we've managed to reach out to during the course of the project delivery um, of the key activities. Um, but this is a delightful one that we weren't sure that this would happen in <laughs> quite this format, um, but it was worth the wait. and. Um, you will see a slightly unconventional exhibition space. It is still a uh, work in progress. It is not um, finished, the work to the, the aisle, as you can see, but there's a spanking new uh, ceiling there and uh, there's no risk to life nor limb. Um, and here on, on the ground, just uh, one of our volunteers looking at the tiles that I think Laura will be talking about how the children made in their, their new setting. So thank you for listening. Um, I suppose I'd just like to conclude by just saying it's been an immensely rewarding project. Rose is spot on. It's been a lot of fun. Um, and I think having partners who are willing to be flexible with you um, has been very, very important as well. And those creative conversations, not just with the artists, but with the designers, with the volunteers, my goodness, have they been stimulating. And I hope that the end results have reflected that flexibility um, and collaboration that, that I think is the sign of really good partnership working. So thank you very much for listening. I'll stop sharing. Are there any questions? And who got the answer right about William Kidman? I want to know. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice try, Becky. I'm going to respond. Anyone else? I, I, how did you? How did a handkerchief work? Worth six pence? We've got an answer three. here. Okay, Beth. Oh, very good. Yes. Correct. Oh, Green, not Gretna Green. Um. Oh, where was it? But anyway, Australia <laughs> for life. Absolutely. He was sentenced to seven years for stealing a handkerchief worth six pence. And again, you can imagine that made quite an impression on the young people. Um. Anyway, that that's that's the frivolous stuff. Are there any? <laughs> Are there any questions in particular? I didn't see any hands raised.
I think it might be coffee time then. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's just check the chat. Um, no, yeah. there's nothing in chat. Okay. Uh, smashing. All right. Uh, shall we then? Oh, We've got one minute. here. There's okay. one question from Carol Ward. Who decided to apply for the grant to Historic England and was moving the exhibition part of the proposal? Uh, no, it wasn't. Um, we uh, obviously um, keep in touch with Historic England um, and um, we had a conversation with them about an urgent repairs grant and we were very fortunate to secure the funding um, to repair both aisle roofs. Uh, and that work is, is still underway. So we've repaired the South Isle and North Isle is in progress. So just to add to that, the, the ambition of the, the proposal, it's, um, I think, dare I say, Rosie, we're camping out a bit. We're taking advantage of the work having been um, completed. And I should have said that it is just si simply not possible to reopen the exhibition in its original intended home, which is Islington Museum and Archives. The museum is still closed. The archives is open um, to one person at a time to go and look at the archives. And that, in any case, they have a backlog of exhibitions that they are obliged to try and put on. Um, so our first port of call is just not available to us. So, you know, we're very, very fortunate to have a second option, aren't we, Rosie? Uh, we are, oh, but it, it is lovely that we managed to put it in uh, the church, in the building itself. So um, let me just look at the time. Uh, it is 10.47, so we're pretty spot on for time. If we haven't got any more questions, um, I'll pause the recording. If everybody just wants to stay logged on and just turn your uh, camera off and then come back and join us again at 11.15 after coffee, that would be great. Okay, um, so hello everybody. Um, we are back again and um, it's now 11.15 so hopefully we can crack on with the second half of the session and that contains two presentations from Laura Moffat on different subjects. Laura is the Director of Art and Christianity and has been a key partner in this project. And um, the first presentation, I have a title as Tales from the Crypt, Art and Learning, but Laura may have, like Susan, changed it. So um, <laughs> over to Laura. Thank you, Rosie. And hello, everybody. It's great to join you um, from Leighton Stone. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel very privileged in being able to give this bit of a talk, which was supposed to be done by Anna and Nir, the artists, uh, but they unfortunately couldn't make today. Um, I feel privileged just because it, it was really extraordinary work that I think they did with the children. Um, and it was a really fun part of the project as well. So uh, we've talked about fun already, but it, it was genuinely um, a really great experience working with them. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, here we go. 
and hopefully you will see. Rosie, give me a shout if it's not showing now. Okay, so um, as Rosie's mentioned, we were tasked with, um, I would say we, Art and Christianity was brought in as a partner in order to help deliver a series of workshops for the children at the New River College, which um, is literally round the corner from the church, practically on the square. It's a new building and it's part of an academy where they have a secondary school also in, in Islington. And this is their, their primary school. Um, we were asked to find some artists. And I think as Judith and Steph from Arts and Heritage mentioned, uh, that's very often um, a reason for, for people to come to us, for organisations to come to us, um, because I know finding an artist is, is often an issue. Um, but I think I will talk a bit more about that when I give the second presentation um, uh, later on this morning. Um, so to say briefly, Anna Sikorska was an artist known to us already. She has worked with a number of churches and I knew that she also did a lot of work with um, uh, homeless groups and with um, art therapy groups. Uh, so Anna I knew was a, a safe pair of hands and in fact Anna then suggested she work with Nir, who she knew already, um, who she knew also to be um, really suitable for the project. Um, I then met Nir and we entered into discussions about how they might do things and I was totally confident that they would see it through. Um, we had uh, some restrictions in terms of how much time with the children we have. They have a, a fairly short day. It's a, it's a pupil referral centre. So in fact, um, the children who are there, there's, there's quite a small number of them. And of course, they, they have some very difficult um, home lives that they have to deal with. They're not always there week in, week out, day in, day out. But in general, the, uh, the head teacher there, Clyde, suggested that there would be um, a sort of core group of around 12 children a week who could work with the artists um, for a session on a Monday. And we spread that out through um, I have logs for 12, it, I think it originally said eight workshops, but I have logs for 12 workshops that happened through the autumn term last year. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So diving straight in, um, Nia was, uh, Anna couldn't make that first session, so Nia was able to do a sort of introductory session with the children where he met with them, he, he just talked with them I think. Although having said that, he also showed them uh, a clip from um, Coco, the film. I don't know if any of you have seen it. It's a, a sort of children's film, um, a Pixar film, uh, about the sort of Day of the Dead culture in, in Mexico. Um, he thought that was a good way in for the children to start thinking about uh, memory, about how children deal with um, with losing people, with death. Um, and I think he spoke quite personally to the children about uh, people that he'd lost in his life. Um, and so began to, to build up a relationship with the children. Um, one of the first things they also did uh, was to visit the crypt in the church. So we were able to um, make that possible for them. I say the crypt, actually it wasn't the crypt, was it? I think they just went into the church, hard hats and everything. And then the, the, the workshops began with, as we, as we talked about earlier on, the, um, the idea that making a silhouette of yourself as a sort of self-portrait was a, um, you know, a, a very popular thing that happened back in the historic period that we were exploring with the children. Um, so we had this opportunity to use props and uh, the artist rigged up a screen and color, using colour filters um, on the lights that they were using and the children took turns to um, enact uh, sometimes uh, an action or something that spoke about who they were personally, their identity. Um, I think with the, the spoon and the saucepan, uh, one child said something about, um, this is for me because I like cooking at home, something like that. 
anyway, so we so we have some nice uh, we have a nice record of the children uh, using making these silhouettes with each other and using some of the props that were provided. Um, that led on to um, work with light boxes and with again color color filters, but using acetate and a number of um, pre-cut stickers and silhouettes that the artists had prepared for the children to work with. I think they absolutely loved these. There, there was one comment from a child who saw the picture of um, the cutout, sorry, of the church and said, oh, everybody will want that one. That's brilliant. <laughs> um, they, they were, you, well, you can see just Dan in the, uh, on the right hand slides there, um, how sort of engrossed I think they were by, by using these lovely sort of um, overlay, layers of colour uh, with, the, with the silhouettes on top. And that, um, that really went right through the, the project as you'll see, it, it sort of repeats itself both in the design of the, um, the curated work, the museum uh, panels that we had and in the children's work. Here we can see uh, how they use some of those works on the windows and parents were able to see them from the outside when they came to pick up children. Um, what you see on the right there, we've got a couple of shots from the um, small exhibition that happened at the end of the, of the workshops within the school and our wonderful researcher there, Rebecca, getting into the, um, the mood of things uh, and donning a, a bonnet that was used. Um, <clears throat> following workshops um, took the children into the sort of realm of mark making and they were allowed to use these sort of small tiles of clay. Um, sorry, but before that I should say they, they used slates so we, we uh, explored the idea that they were, um, you know, going back in time uh, using a slate instead of a book or indeed in, in instead of a, a tablet, a, an iPad or something, um, and, and how children um, in schools, Victorian schools, would have used slates. Um, I, did, I couldn't find any um, photos of those, but apparently they, they recorded, uh, they took, took photos of what they had drawn on their slates before erasing them again and then mark making on these clay tiles and again that was an opportunity for them to explore um, clay as a material where it came from um, and using stamps and obviously other implements for mark making they made this wonderful set of, of tiles which are in the exhibition now another little sort of iconographic um, thing that the artist picked up on were the bells. So um, obviously bells, you know, have a, a historic connection to churches, to uh, funerals, to weddings, and that they spoke a lot with the children about what bells mean, what what kind of bells you hear these days. They, they obviously um, recognised that bells were part of their school day, that bells marked the beginning and ends of lessons and that kind of thing. Um, and they were given the opportunity to make their own designs and marks on these little clay bells, which the artist then uh, fired for them. Um, they were allowed to use colour, but you can see in the exhibition case there some colour, some gold um, glazes that they put on as well. Um, so, so yeah, the bells featured in the museum um, exhibition that, that that slide on the left is from the um, Islington Museum which obviously unfortunately didn't um, didn't in the end open but they were also I think they're shown in the church too. Um, another session that um, we touched on earlier you saw one of the um, I want to call it a ledger but I think Susan used another term for it the large book with the marbled papers um, on it. Uh, the children were shown some of those and were then allowed in slightly smaller groups, I think groups of sort of three or four, um, allowed to do their own marbling on paper. Um, this required 
quite a high level of <laughs> supervision. Um, and I dropped into the school on, a, on an afternoon when they were doing that. It was really amazing to see them, um, you know, taking a lot of care over this tray of water with oil paints swirling around on top. Um, but they, you can see the, the yellow card there and the blue card. It's not, not terribly um, strong marbling, but you can, you can just about see the marbling, marbled effect that they got there. And then in a following session, when the, once the marble papers were dry, they used those to create invitations um, to, to take home to their parents uh, or guardians to, to invite them to the exhibition that happened in the school. Um, you can see here that they borrowed from the, um, there was a previous slide again in, in Susan's presentation of a sort of shield that one of the volunteers was holding, uh, the shield sort of, uh, it had Holy Trinity Clasby Square on it or something, but um, they borrowed from that shape and used their marbled um, papers to create invitations in that shape. Uh, so here are lovely artists and this is um, a shot from the exhibition in the school. You can see that the um, fantastic little light boxes that were made. These were actually made in um, using small lunch boxes, sort of cardboard lunch boxes that had a plastic lid um, and uh, one of those sort of battery powered um, string of lights that they could put inside uh, and then the, the, the coloured acetate on top. Um, and they made this incredible display for, for their parents to come and see. Um, they showed also the, the silhouettes there again on the windows. Um, so yeah, as it's just been mentioned, the, um, the exhibition took place in the school and then was set up in the museum and the archive, but unfortunately <laughs> had then to be moved again um, to the church, where you can see a couple of little shots here of um, some of the children's work there. And we're just in the, um, in the process at the moment of trying to get the children to come and see their work in the, in the church too. So that's, I think that's 15 minutes, if that's okay. I will, that's, I think that's my last slide. Yeah. So I will stop sharing that. So any questions for Laura? There are none in the chat room. I can't see any others. Oh, Tess has got one. Um, just wondering, um, when you approach the school, I and mean, it's a pupil referral unit, it's, it's quite a sort of specialised setup. Were they, I mean, did they welcome you with open arms? Did you need to persuade them? How, how did it go? Uh, I'll, I'll ask Rosie to answer that as well, but I will just say that because um, Rosie did most of the work to set that up originally, but the response that we had from the school was brilliant and, um, and from their teachers, it was so positive. They, they're obviously um, in the very hard position of trying to teach core curricula to children that are got way behind in where they should be with their learning um, but actually having having the chance to do some art with the with the children was was i think for the teachers as much as the children almost um just a really really positive thing and not something that they often get time for or space for or have the materials for or the imagination and unfortunately this is true of all schools, I think, a lot of the time, certainly primary schools. Um, and it was another reason to have artist engagement working in schools. Yeah. So, Laura, and they, and they don't have the budget for it either. So the fact that we could come in with a funded workshop offer was absolutely fabulous. And um, I, it, I was just so sad when they ended because these kids had benefited so much from these workshops it was just so sad that it had to stop after one term um, and when I when I spoke to Clyde I brought him round um, 
I brought him around the building and he had a look around and we chatted through uh, how it might work and, and what we would um, deliver. And his response was, this is amazing because nobody ever wants to work with us. And, and um, yeah, and, and that was the response. And, and it's, well, it's just so wonderful to have had that opportunity to help these kids and um, to work to work with Clyde and the staff and the pupils. It's been brilliant. So, um, yeah, I, I, all I can say is I thoroughly recommend it. Um, Suzanne has asked, um, who came up with all the workshop ideas? Was it primarily the artists? It was, yes. It was primarily the artists, though um, they, of course, did have that session with Susan where I think a lot of ideas came up and, and were shared. Um, they, you know, they took the time to understand some of the historical research that had gone on already. And, um, you know, a lot of it came out of that. But, you know, that's why you work, work with artists, because they have loads of ideas all the time. And, you know, there were have lots right from the get go. Um, I think Joe had a question. Um, yes, thank you so much, Laura, for that. It was really, really interesting. I had I was intrigued by the, the pupil referral unit um, work as well, and I just I guess I just wanted to know if there were any major takeaways you had specifically from that work um, that you would take forward. Um, any unforeseen challenges, um, things like that. Well, yes, I mean, I think Laura and I'll probably both answer that. We certainly had unforeseen challenges in the sense that working with a pupil referral unit is not like working with an ordinary school. So it's very small uh, groups of children. Um, when we took them around the building, we had to split them up into small groups um, and the workshops had to be done in small groups. And I, we didn't really appreciate that. So when we put the application in, we'd said we would do X number of workshops with 15 children in a workshop. And it, it just didn't work like that because I think when the teachers and when everybody got their head around what actually was involved, it, it, it simply wasn't possible. So it was, it was groups of six. Um, but fortunately, I mean, the, the, there is obviously the flexibility there. Um, we, I was working very closely with Rebecca Jenkins and I would email her and update her and say, this is now the, the, the scenario, is this okay? And she would go, yes, that's fine. Um, but yes, it certainly, it's, it, it does definitely need a, a quite a flexible approach to it, I would say. Would you have anything else to add, Laura? No, I think that's, I think you've said it. Mm. Thank you. But I think it's all the more rewarding for it. Mm. Mm. Are there any, oh, Susan, Susan's got a question, or maybe she wants a point. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just going to add in um, my experience because I went in to deliver the history workshop for with the pupils and the one tip I came away with I mean I've gone into primary school secondary schools done history workshops but you can never know what people that what the children are going to be interested in and the thing that really blew me away was um, they liked the stories they were very chatty very engaged but the thing that really held their attention was something I thought was going to be very boring for them, which was the big tome that um, I was referring to, which was the ledger book um, with all the writing in the, ha the handwriting. And they poured over it. And these are seven, eight year olds. And I thought that's the dustiest, driest, most remote thing. But actually having the tangible object there, thanks to the loan service, was fantastic. So. I mean, that was my huge learning moment was don't dumb down. Don't think your audience isn't capable of picking up a really strong idea. And similarly with the morning letters, they completely understood that fascinating fact because they've been introduced to the, the, the process of grieving and mourning by Nia and Anna in those early conversations with them. They were incredibly mature in how they handled them. And we talked about how you'd feel receiving one of those in the post. So, um, I wasn't sure, I'd never done anything in a pupil referral unit and I was just blown away by, you know, the unexpected uh, richness and maturity and depth that they showed um, for all possible 
you know, um, what Rosie's already said about, you know, conventional learning, they don't, you know, don't fit the, what you would expect their, their knowledge levels to be, but it was, it was very rewarding. Sorry, rather rambling comment, but um, it was, it was fantastic. Oh, thank you. So we've had a question in the chat. Um, uh, which said, did we have a relationship with the Prue before the project? Um, and the answer is no, we didn't. And the way that we started the relationship was simply by sending in an email and having a meeting. Um, and I mean, I understand that sometimes it's quite hard to get into schools, but um, Clyde, the principal, is very switched on and very keen to engage. Um, I mean, he's awfully busy. So the reality is you can set up a meeting with him and he'll cancel it because he's he's been called away to have a meeting with, you know, an emergency meeting. And that happened all the time. But um, the fact is, you just have to go with that, rearrange, crack on. Um, but yes, he was absolutely uh, very keen, very engaging. And, you know, I think, think the thing about it is, if you're working with the Prue, they're actually so desperate to work with you because as Clyde said, nobody ever wants to, um, then, you know, he's very, very open. Uh, ordinary mainstream schools, uh, again, some will be, some won't be. And, and frankly, I would say, just, just try, send in the emails. And if people reply, great, go with that lead. And if they don't go with another one, that, that's how I would do it. Um, lovely. So if we are done with that set of questions, um, I will then ask Laura to talk rather more generally now about how to work with and appoint an artist in residence on your project. Okay. Um, I'm going to begin by just sharing my web browser, which I hope is okay. Um, because I just thought it might be useful to start this little session with um, a, a set of examples, really. Um, the, the term artist in residence can mean so many different things. Um, it's a very, you know, broad category of basically an artist working with an organisation of some sort or a community of some sort. Um, so, to start with some um, <clears throat> exemplars, I suppose, places, I mean, these are clearly, well, National Trust, very well funded, um, uh, places that have enough cash to do this sort of thing properly, but um, you'll see the National Trust have now, they call it Trust New Art, um, they have a, an extensive program of working with artists um, in places of um, significance historical significance i think you'll notice as i just scroll through this i hope it's not annoying somebody else scrolling through a page for you but a lot of these are outdoors as you can see um sometimes working with collections um themselves rather than with architecture uh sometimes perhaps performance um and i'll come on to speak a bit more about um different ways in which um, residence, residencies might fulfill what you're trying to achieve. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one of those that's worth, I, I'll send this bunch of links through to you, um, or they'll be a, available afterwards, um, so that you can spend more time looking at them. That's one. Uh, there's another one, um, there's an organisation called Meadow Arts, who I think have worked predominantly in the west of England, um, but are a national organisation. They've done a lot of commissioning artists. Here's um, Ironbridge, um, again, sort of embedding an artist in a in a historic site um, and curating large scale works of art. There are, of course. Um, the biggies like the National Gallery where they appoint um, annually an artist in residence to work again with the collection. Uh, they're, they're sort of given kind of free reign of all the paintings in storage. This is the current artist there. Um, and 
libraries to this is the National uh, Library of Scotland. Um, interestingly, using sound um, as is the oops, sorry that the zoom thing is getting in the way of my there we go. As is the British Library at the moment, they've got a sound sound artist working there too. Um, it's not only museums um, and historic places, but uh, this is an organisation called Vital Arts who work with the Barts um, NHS Trust. So they have artists in residence who um, spend time within the hospitals that they um, oversee. We've got uh, Whips Cross Hospital, uh, Barts, obviously the London, um, and some of those are historic buildings in their own right. Um, next, coming on to um, some of the ecclesial, ecclesiastical sorry, uh, buildings that um, have seen works of, well, have seen residencies. Um, th this unfortunately doesn't function anymore, Art and Sacred Places. It was an organisation that was started at the millennia, millennium um, and uh, has sadly fallen by the wayside due to lack of funding. But they still have um, a website where you can see some of the projects that um, they undertook. This one was um, in Manchester, uh, working between the cathedral and the mosque. Um, and they were they were a um, an interfaith organisation. So if we go back to um, here, you'll see they work with churches and cathedrals, but also with, um, you'll see their uh, uh, project with the Long Barrow Sacred Site, with um, a group called Road Peace, about how you mark um, places where there have been fatal traffic accidents, um, the Hindu uh, Hindu temple project. Um, so a really interesting bunch of um, projects there. Um, this is uh, Art in Romney Marsh, which um, is another very good case study of um, artists working with very, very hard to get to um, rural churches in Romney Marsh. I think there are six of them all together. And they, um, this usually runs every two years, I think. Um, so they invite a, a, uh, a kind of combination of local artists and usually one or two sort of hand-picked um, bigger names uh, to come and make work, site-specific work for these six churches down in the Hackney Marshes. There's a nice little map of, <clears throat> excuse me, of the churches. Um, they, have a, they have a good sort of audience amongst the um, kind of walking, cycling, uh, bird watching community who, who um, are in the area. Um, I haven't got websites for these, but um, you may remember that Durham Cathedral quite often um, was in the news for its artist residency program, uh, which lasted, I think, I think almost 20 years. Um, it doesn't happen anymore, again, due to, to lack of funding, but it was um, really a pioneering residency scheme um, within a cathedral headed up by one of the canons there at the time, Bill Hall, um, and included people like Bill Viola, who um, made one of his most, most sort of famous works of um, video art for the, for the cathedral at the time, a work called Messenger. Um, and they in turn sort of um, influenced other cathedrals. So Gloucester Cathedral then for a while ran a residency program, which was also very successful um, for the, the, the years that it ran again doesn't run anymore. Um, I think I think that's one of the biggest challenges actually. If you set up a, a program, um, is is just finding the ongoing funding to to make that happen. Um, 
I think I'll probably come back to these uh, these web pages. Actually, I'll whiz you through them right now so that we're not switching um, back and forth too much. But um, there are some very useful arts resources um, on Access Web. Access Web is a big national organization that can help you to, as you can see there, you can submit your art opportunity for free. So if you're thinking of setting up a, um, a residency scheme or, or just a one-off project, you can always use them to help get your word out there if you want um, artists to apply for your opportunity. Um, you can also use it as a sort of tool for searching for artists. So they have a lot of different categories of artists and you can use it as a search tool to look at um, artists and what their, you know, what their specialisms are, if they work in communities or da -da -da -da, that kind of thing. Um, there's another very good um, national website stroke um, magazine called AN Artist Newsletter and that's a, another sort of go-to place for artists to look for um, jobs basically. Okay I'm going to see if I can, I'm going to stop sharing that um, and then just go back into um, Keynote, sorry for this but um, so we'll go back to here. Okay, so I'm just going to whiz you through that. Those are the examples we've just looked at. Um, some things to think about. And um, I hope that these questions are probably the kinds of questions you might be asking. And, um, you know, in my experience, are the, are the, the main questions that people come to us with. Um, so how long should it be? How long is a residency? Well, anything really, how long is a piece of string? Anything from a couple of weeks to a couple of years. I think the, the, the deciding factor will be, you know, what you want to achieve, how long you can fund it for, and how long you think it's going to take for an artist to make a significant, um, you know, build up a meaningful relationship with that community. Um, and in that, there's obviously the, the question of, you know, realistically, how many opportunities can you offer for that artist to meet with those people? Or, um, or, you know, how long might they need to explore a collection? Or how long might they need to understand a building, say? Okay, so, so let those factors help you decide how long the residency might be. Who is it going to be for? So, uh, I mean, obviously churches are very often wanting to reach out to their wider community. Um, we heard Arts and Heritage talk a lot about um, what museums are trying to achieve, sort of, you know, in-depth repeat visit, um, in-depth visits, new audiences, uh, all of that. It, it's, got to, um, it's got to be led by that, really. Who do you want to, who do you want to reach with this? Uh, project and obviously for the Cloudsley Centre project, um, you know, we wanted it to be led by those people that are walking past the church most days of the week. We wanted it to be very local, and the and the New River College was ideal in that these children are 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 literally walking past on their way to school most days and could you know could hopefully learn something about their local environment. Um, I, I've put there what heritage is driving this and who is it for so I mean I'm sorry I don't know um, enough about all the people that are attending this workshop to know what types of heritage you are representing say but I, I hope that's just a, a question that you can sort of ask yourself you know what what is it what type of heritage am, am I dealing with and um, how, how might an artist help me explore that. Um, Often the nub of a, of a residency is where the artist will be during that time. So these are, you know, perhaps a bit obvious, but you need to offer accommodation in the studio space if the artist isn't local. Or should the artist be local? I mean, uh, it, it doesn't always work out so well because, you know, there may not be the right artist living locally. But I think if you can, um, appoint a local artist that's generally a, a good a good way forward because they will obviously already understand the area that they're working in. 
Um, sometimes, just an, as an example, sometimes it's helpful if you don't have um, an obvious place where you could accommodate an artist or give them studio space, um, you could, um, well, basically ask around. Um, I know of a, a church in Tottenham Hale where they had, um, they had to put up an artist and, and offer them some studio space for six months, I think it was. And they found something just by asking the local authority. Um, you know, they, it turned out there was a, an empty building nearby where the artist could be. And, you know, so, so you know, don't close that one down if you, um, if you don't have an immediate uh, place to offer. So what outcome do you want from an, a residency? And I think, uh, again, think, think very practically. Do you want an exhibition at the end of it? Um, do you want something, you know, do you want, do you want that to look like a traditional exhibition or could that be a, a single work, an installation of some sort, like, you know, perhaps like the, um, uh, the, the image we saw of the Iron Bridge with the, all the sort of textiles attached to it. Um, could it be inside the building or could it be outside the building? And again, you know, thinking literally outside the box, perhaps, um, you know, at, something that's outside the building has that advantage that um, passers-by are going to see it um, more frequently. You don't have the problem of the threshold and getting people across it. Um, sound, light, uh, some things that don't interfere with the fabric of the building are often brilliant ways to engage artists. Um, you know, increasingly artists work, do work in sound or in performance or you know they they'll still call themselves visual artists but um they may well be um you know find it very easy to to work or as again as artists and heritage showed us someone like matt stokes who works in collaboration with other artists of of different media um can be a, a really successful outcome and i think this last question um is, is an important one actually. So how much do you want the community's involvement to be evident in what the artist is going to produce at the end of it? Um, if there's time, I'll show you a, a quick example from a project that we worked on um, up in Newcastle, where it wasn't, it wasn't, if you like. So, um, you know, there are, there are, there are very in-depth discussions we could get into about um, possibly the ethics, if you like, of um, using a community to achieve an artwork or, um, you know, is, is it right that you, um, that you take stories of refugees' hardships and create something that um, looks beautiful? You know, there are all sorts of really complicated um, questions to be asked there. And uh, I, think it, I think it is Im important that you explore that right from the beginning um, about, you know, just what, what will the community's role be in, in what you're trying to do. Um, so this is, this is always the, the question we're asked, how, how do I find an artist? And those are those, um, some of those, two of those websites I showed you previously, Access Web and AN. Um, Arts Council is also a um, useful place to look. But I think, um, I think also going local can, can work too. So, you know, have a little think about whether there are galleries or museums or art schools in your area. Um, and lastly, you could, you know, ask Arts and Heritage or ask us, um, we can help. And then funding, um, the, the million dollar question, um, it, can it be part of your HLF? I mean, so the Clousy Centre project obviously is a, is a case in point of um, having funding built in already for the artist engagement. H having said that, the, uh, the Culture Seeds grant that we got, 5,000 pounds, that came in slightly, after, uh, slightly later on. Um, so it may be that you've got some funding through an HF um, bid perhaps, but you need to add to it. So in which case there are, I mean, I, I think as Arts and Heritage says, have a look on the Arts Council's website and they will 
have lists of other places you can apply to, but you can also apply to the Arts Council um, for schemes like this. And I mean, something I do frequently is I just spend ages looking at um, other people's schemes, examples of other things, and, you know, going to their page where they list who has funded that project and you know, making notes, looking them up, trying, uh, trying our luck with them. Um, do I have time? I, I'll, I'll just quickly run you through this. Um, this, is, this is the project I mentioned in Newcastle. Um, we, we were asked to um, collaborate in a festival called Platforma, which celebrates migration. Uh, it's for immigrants, it's, it's art by immigrants and about immigrants. And it has a kind of itinerant um, program where it travels to a different city every two years. And we were asked to be part of the festival when it took place in Newcastle in 2017. We had to move rather quickly. Uh, there was only a very sort of short time scale for this project. But we appointed an artist um, called Katia Camelli, who had proposed that for St. John, um, uh, St. John the Baptist, right in the centre, city centre of Newcastle, where there are six windows um, like this of plain Victorian glass, uh, that she would create um, patterns using a, a sort of um, self-sticking, again, a kind of acetate really, um, patterns influenced by the, the refugee community in Newcastle. Um, she also made a sound installation uh, asking people to sing songs of, um, songs that reminded them of home. Uh, and these are, these are three of the windows on one side of the building. So this was meant to be a sort of solution to, you know, what's quite a busy, um, a busy church, got quite a lot of stuff in it. You know, you, you wanted to avoid um, having large sculptures or whatever, but these windows as they were, they were, you know, not particularly fancy, they were plain glass. Uh, she chose to, to make her sort of intervention there. So these three windows represent China, Iran, and the DRC. The designs, sorry, that's a different project. The designs were taken and sort of um, uh, developed through conversations with um, people that Katia met during a residency. Now that was, it was a very short residency. So there was a limit to how much she could draw out of those conversations and relationships with the, the people that she met there. So this is one example of, of, of a case where the artist had quite a strong influence in what the work was going to look like. But nevertheless, there was, there was something feeding through from the community that she was asked to work with. Okay, I think that's my, my 15 minutes. So I will stop sharing. Where's my mouse gone? Hmm. Sorry, I don't seem to have. There it is. <laughs> okay, there we go. We're back. Smashing. Um, I had noticed uh, one or two questions. So there's a question about when finding an artist, should funding be provided or will an artist bring their own funding? Um, I'd say it would be very rare for an artist to bring their own funding. There are there are artists who are who are used to um, making funding applications and who are very good at it. Um, so if you're lucky, you might choose an artist who has that kind of experience and who can help you to to then draw in funding. Um, but it's it's most likely going to be you that has to do that most of that work. And then we got a bit about community audits and toolkits. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's quite a big question um, in the sense that, um, I mean, yes, well, actually, Becky, you might be well placed to answer that one. Um, yeah, so if, if you mean doing a community audit, um, perhaps when you're starting up a project to see what's going on out there, what other organisations there are, 
um, yes, there are toolkits. Um, if you're in London Diocese, we actually have a, um, a brief for a community audit to, for a consultant, which can be adapted for any church. Um, and there are community audits that you can access using uh, going online. Um, crossing the Threshold Toolkit, which comes from the Diocese of Hereford and the Church of England, they have links to toolkits. I mean, they're, they're basically a way of finding out what's going on in your area and therefore highlight for you, in, if we're talking about this sort of project, what, what possible partnerships there might be out there, what schools are out there, what other groups that might appreciate an art project or get something out of it. Mm. I mean, we can always put, but well, we can always see if it's possible to put the brief on the diocese's website. Um, but we'd have to, we would have to um, take soundings on that first. I can't promise that. But if Laura wants to email me separately, I could um, perhaps find out a bit more about what you're actually looking for in more detail. Um, there is another question from Sarah Bayliss about um, what about opportunities in Wales? Um, working with churches and church organisations uh, in Wales. Does your scope, Laura, extend to Wales? Or <laughs> what other organisations are there in Wales that you might know of? Um, we'd love to work in Wales. Yeah, we, we could. I mean, we, Art and Christianity is a very small outfit um, and we have to sort of carefully choose what we can manage. Um, but I have had conversations with people in Wales and um, while we haven't actually done a project in Wales, we, you know, we could in, in theory. Um, I, would, I would contact Meadow Arts probably. Um, I know they've worked, they've, I'm sure they have worked with Hereford Cathedral before. Um, and, you know, while that's not, is Hereford Wales? I forget, or is it? No, <laughs> it's Hereford. <laughs> um, anyway, um, it's on the border I think, I think they probably would unless unless there's something in their um you know in their constitution that says they can only work in england but i don't i don't think that would um because of course the charity commission covers england and wales so i don't think i don't think it would um preclude that um i do know of um i know of somebody doing quite a lot of work in North Wales, on the North Wales coast, doesn't help me too much in mid Wales. Um, but why, why don't you email me, Sarah, and we can, we can talk a bit more about what, what you're thinking, um, perhaps. I'm sure, I'm sure we could put you in touch with some people, even if we couldn't help you ourselves. Um, and we have a question about how do you plan a budget in order to apply for funding? How much are artists paid? Um, I mean, certainly when we planned the Tales from the Crypt budget, we, I did quite a bit of scoping and sounding out as to how much time um, this would take and I asked um, everybody to, to send me a proposal and a brief so that we very much scoped it out and um, a fee quote and that's really important because if you don't have a fee quote from somebody then you don't know how much to apply for funding. And the other thing is um, we then put a 5% contingency on the project because no matter how carefully you scope something out everything something will always change and you might be able to swap between cost headings in your budget but sometimes you can't and therefore having a contingency is a little surplus um, for unknowns is really important but you have to go out and speak to people and literally get quotes in advance um, otherwise you can't you, you can't um, guarantee you'll get it right. Could I just add because you ask a, a really good question about how do you anticipate the cost of an artwork well <laughs> that's that can be a, yeah, a real nightmare in some ways. Um, but I think the best thing to do is to actually set yourself, you say, say, what can we afford? Um, what might be realistic here? So um, a materials budget, basically. Um, and, you know, perhaps it's, perhaps it's 2000 pounds or, you know, it could be a bit more. And then you have to say to the artists and you have to be quite strict with them and say, you've got to make your 
your work within that budget. Um, I mean, if, if, if you really, really struggle, sometimes artists will say, well, you know, can't we have a bit more, um, you know, perhaps you can find a bit more through something or, you know, as, as um, Rosie suggested, swapping things from other bits of a budget. But, but generally it's best to kind of think, okay, you know, as a percentage of the whole budget or something, what can we allocate to materials for this artwork? And then ask an artist to cut their cloth accordingly. And they're used to doing that, so you know it shouldn't really be a, a problem. There's one one final question from Tessa about how frequently have art projects been funded by the um, National Lottery Heritage Fund, or other or other sources? Are they more common? Um, <laughs> I would say. I think it's other sources actually that are more common. I, I get so confused between um, where, whose money is what. I mean, the art, the, it seems like the Arts Council and lottery money, I mean, Arts Council grants are basically lot, lottery money as far as I understand it. Is that right? Well, some of them are and some of them aren't, I don't know. But I think- um, That's right, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I mean, the, the, the problem with churches, if, if we're talking about church heritage projects, um, and this goes for, you know, building work and as, as, as much as it does for art engagement work, um, they want to see that it's for everybody and not just for your church congregation that comes on a Sunday. Okay, so that, that's in terms of Arts Council or Lottery. However, if, if you want it to be specifically for your regular worshipping community and you want it to be something that explores Christianity or, you know, or, or even another faith or whatever, there are, there are some other funders that want to do that. So there are, on our website, you, you might find there's, um, we have a whole page of useful links. There are funders there that want to fund works of art in churches say okay so so don't it you know if the arts council or lottery funds don't quite fit what you're trying to achieve if you are working with a church don't give up um look around a bit more because there are yeah there are some funders that do that that don't mind if it's only for your church community rather than for everybody i mean i think Joe's going to come and talk about um, the lottery in just a second, but the reality is, um, you know, you need to work out what you want your project to achieve and to deliver, and then you need to see which funder most closely aligns with that. And it might be Heritage, it might be Arts Council, um, you know, but you need to have a clear idea as to what you want to achieve and, and then try and source the funding accordingly, I would say. Um, and if there aren't any more um, questions, then uh, where are we, where are we? Uh, I think I would like to now just go to our final speaker, which is Jo from the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Um, she's an engagement manager for the London uh, and South team. And uh, she's very kindly agreed to come and speak to us um, about uh, the lottery and lottery funding. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, just really pleased to be here with you. So thanks for inviting me as well. Um, had some really great case studies. Um, so I've really enjoyed, you know, hearing that as well, because obviously we're in very different times at the moment than what we're usual to. And um, yeah, it's just nice to, to actually go back to the core of, of what's always been our, our work. Um, so I'm an engagement manager, so, sorry, Joe, Joe McAleer, um, engagement manager for the London and the South at the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Um, I'm actually based here in London, um, in Bermondsey, um, but in more usual times, um, you could say my patch would be sort of Surrey, Sussex area. Um, I suppose um, I just wanted to kick off by hopefully managing some expectations about what I'm going to be able to talk to you about today. Um, when I was first organising this with, with Hannah and Rosie, I'm very aware that um, this was obviously pre-COVID, 
um, and we were talking about things like what makes a fundable project and, and the like. Um, and obviously we're, we're working in a much more different context now. So I thought what might be more helpful for everyone today in the 15 minutes that I have is to just basically go through that context with you um, as to the benefit of those who don't know who um, we are. And just to briefly go through that first, um, what we've been up to as a fund since COVID hit us and then um, sort of our direction of travel um, after that. Um, so I'll just get up the slide now. Is everybody able to see that? Great. Oops. Can I just get a hands up? I think there might be a slight delay or is it, are we okay in terms of sound? I think, I think you might have to press, start the slideshow because at the moment it's just showing it as, um, sure. Hang on. So you do from beginning or yeah, from current slide, see what, if that does it. Has that worked? Not quite. Oh dear. It had to be me. Um, what should we do? Shall I stop? And then maybe if maybe if someone could on their end and I just sort of prod when it needs moving along. Is that the best or? Uh, have you clicked from the beginning? Is uh, that one here? Yeah, I think. Let me um, stop share. Okay, let's see if I can manage it. Um, hang on one second. Thank you. Um, in fact, I haven't got it open, so sorry. Bear with me. It will be two seconds. Um, just open it up. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, right. Sorry. No, it's me. <laughs> Let, me try Let me try again. Well, um, hang on, hang on. Um, Right, here we go. Okay. I'm just opening up PowerPoint now. Right. It's just thinking about life. <laughs> Our technology. Um, no. So, yeah, just to sort of, I guess I don't want to to run over too much because everyone's quite busy. So I'll just crack on um, with what I was what was going to say. Um, so basically for the, for the benefit of those who might not be um, too aware of the fund, um, we're one of the natural, national lottery um, distributors. Um, so in usual times, all of our money would come, that we distribute would um, normally come from ticket sales. Right. Can, um, sorry, can everybody see, so who are we? Yep. Fabulous. Just tell me when to click next. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, so that's an image there just to basically demonstrate that point that um, the best way to think about um, the, the fund is at the core of everything that is funded and what's decided and what we encourage projects to do is that um, this is essentially public money, lottery players money. 
Um, so that we, we need to ensure that for every um, penny pound that gets spent on projects, um, it can be directly related back to our, our, our sort of core principles, which, which are the outcomes and the, um, the mandatory, mandatory outcome, which is that a wider range of people will be involved in heritage. And um, what we've already seen from the case studies to, today is just how wonderfully, um, you know, um, organizations and partners have really um, embraced this um, and have said that they've um, has has produced um, more better projects for it so that's I, I, I guess that's a that's a really fundamental thing to remember um, I think um, yeah so it just it just shows really I think we, we heard from um, from Susan and others about what essentially can also be achieved with the, with that kind of perspective in terms of some of the spontaneous spontaneous and creative um, outcomes that that projects are able to produce without having even realised it when you work with um, communities really closely. Um, so that was done really well. Um, so if you could just go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is just basically to bring back to the point that yes we're one of the national lottery distributors but essentially this um to make the the, the quite clear point that is um the heritage that we are here to fund um having said that there is a broad definition definition of the heritage that um, the fund gives um so as you can see there anything that people value and want to pass on to future generations um, and as you can imagine this um produces quite a wide range of projects um, that we've already seen. Um, next slide, please. So this broadly covers um, the areas that you see listed there. Um, and places of worship, um, I suppose, more, most um, comfortably sits under that um, historic buildings and monument, monuments bracket. Um, as you can see there, just at the bottom, just got a couple of bullet points on what essentially makes for a fundable project um, to the Heritage Fund. Um, and yeah, I think as, as we um, already alluded to, um, the kinds of um, specifically arts um, heritage projects within places of worship um, really really just depicted well in past um, funded projects such as art in Romney marshes uh, art in Romney marsh and obviously what we've, what we've been mainly talking about today which is the tales from the crypt project um, so I guess um, to kind of break down what I would normally do, be doing um, in a non-covid um, world would be going to um, diocese um, led events um, where we would talk about um, open the open program and the kinds of things that we look for within that open program um, to fund. Um, so I think we'll just go now to what we would be um, looking to to speak to people about right now in, in the current situation that we we find ourselves in. So next slide, please. Okay. So in terms of um, where we're up to and of course where we are now in our current situation um, just to give you um, an idea of um, sort of um, the different areas that we've been working on as a fund um, so up until this point our COVID response has been broken down into distributing sort of three emergency funding pots um, so our first was the heritage emergency fund um, which was the immediate response to COVID. Um, and that ran from April to July in 2020, this year. Um, and we offered organizations um, the chance to apply for um, emergency and stabilizing costs to their organizations. Um, so that was um, grants which range from 3000 pounds right up to, to, to the larger amounts um, to the 250K. Um, and it's worth noting um, that sort of within that fund, um, historical buildings and monuments were actually the, the, the heritage area that was given the, the biggest sort of sum in terms of grant award. Um, and for that particular fund, the um, 
final decisions were taken, um, I believe it was the end of August. Next slide, please. Um, oh, no, actually, go back one, sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, so um, after that, the next sort of strand of work for us was um, delivering the Culture Recovery Fund for Heritage. Um, so this was the Department for Culture, Media and Sports Recovery Package for Culture, Arts and Heritage. So that supported arts, museums, cultural institutions, um, and that was de delivered in partnership with Historic England. And that was um, a £90 million pot from DCMS that um, we helped to distribute. Um, and that was aimed at saving and sustaining heritage of significant national in and international importance and was basically, um, you know, again, another emergency um, fund um, in response to COVID. And that was quite oversubscribed. And then finally, the Green Recovery Challenge Fund. Um, so this is currently what we're in the froze with, frozen at the moment. So the deadline for, the, for this fund was at the end of last week. And this is um, dedicated to the natural heritage sector. Um, so delivering environmental projects. Um, and um, this is in collaboration with DEFRA, Natural England Forestry Commission, Environment Agency. Um, and the, 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 the key sort of thing with this fund was um, helping um, organizations retain people in their jobs um, and, the, and the jobs that they're skilled to do. So that's what we're currently delivering at the moment. Now the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so in terms of what we've got coming up, um, it's, it's essentially um, monitoring the, the, the grants that have already made, been made, as I, as I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, and making sure that all of our um, applicants and grantees are receiving all of the, the support that they need during this time. Um, and that goes way back to the, the Heritage Emergency Fund, which was for broadly um, organizations that we'd already funded. So ensuring that um, we're sort of protecting prior investment in as much as we can so that those projects can continue to do all the great work that they, that they set out to do. Um, we also have the ongoing digital campaign. Um, which we committed to before the pandemic um, and information about that can be found on our website and I think it's really clear just from today everything that we've all been experiencing um, how important um, digital capability is during this time um, and how it's going to contribute to a more resilient sector so the pan pandemic has essentially accelerated that that need um, the next one there the heritage resilience fund um, so that's going to be implemented um, for the remainder of this year. So this is um, a £20 million um, recovering, recovering re re resilience pot, um, details of which will be coming soon. Um, so this is um, more aimed at um, helping organisations to adapt to the impacts of COVID. Um, so not, not emergency funding, this is definitely seen as a um continual uh, over, continual um kind of um support package um do you realize my time is up um so i think um that doesn't leave us uh, i suppose for the, the the big question i suppose that everybody wants to get to which is um what a lot of people want to get to which is is what's going on with the open programs um, so they won't be coming back this calendar year, um, to, to be honest, and essentially we're not sure what the, exactly they will look like, as it's too early for us to have a clear picture. Um, um, but I think what we can say for certainty really is that um, it, won't ex it won't be the same and, you know, it won't be as we know it, um, much like um, everything sort of during this time. Um, I think, however, it won't be a massive departure in terms of the outcomes um, that people will be um, kind of familiar with um, from our current strategic framework. So those, those outcomes are fundamentally um, perhaps won't change that much. But again, don't quote me on that. We really 
are still working that out. There was a, um, a board meeting, um, if not last week, um, the week before, where um, these kinds of things are still under discussion. Um, so, um, yeah, essentially, um, that's that. Um, sorry, I'm rushing through, but I do want to get to the next slide. Um, sorry, please, thank you. Um, just because um, I wanted to to highlight the the newsletter sign up, um, which you can see in the middle there, which you can get to from our website. Um, so that will keep you up to date with any developments that are happening as they happen. Um, and um, that's that's going to be ongoing. So I would highly recommend you do that. Also keep an eye out for the Heritage Alliance um, free recovery program, which we funded, re re Rebuilding Heritage, um, just in case there might be some um, useful things um, there. Um, so it's helping the heritage sector in the broader sense with open webinars on topics like leadership and governance, change management, um, marketing, communications, etc. Okay, um, I think final slide, that's the last one. Um, so just my contact details there. Um, and if anybody had any questions, please feel free to fire it off there. I know we've got some time, maybe not that much now. So if you don't, if I don't get to you um, with the next, in the next um, few minutes, then definitely fire off an email to me and we will um, find you an answer hopefully for that. Okay. Brilliant, thank you. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to, there. Uh, does anybody have any questions specifically for Joe? There are, there are none in the chat room. I can see Hazel's got one. Um, can I just ask, uh, I mean, as I understand it, there is going to be a, a huge suppressed tidal wave of uh, organisations wanting to bid in the new open programmes. Is there, as it were, um, any chance that there is money that is accumulating that will boost funding for, uh, you know, that recovery period, which it's just otherwise, it seems like your funds will be so overbid that your criteria will will be raising the bar on um, what, what projects get funded. Absolutely, you've hit the nail on the head in terms of the, what the level of competition is going to be for that um, next year's 2021-22 um, lottery funding pot at least. Um, so, um, again, it's very much for um, sort of um, board and management's decision to decide what those priorities um, will take. Um, and yeah, I'm afraid there's not really much we can kind of um, confirm at, at this point on that. Um, so did you, was there another question within that that you needed to, so it's just to confirm really, yes, that the, the high level of competition there will be, yeah, essentially. Um, so it's just to sort of prepare for that. And I think it goes back to um, what Rosie was saying about fundamentally what you want to achieve within your projects and whether they, um, it's all about making, we, we always bang on about this, making the case, making the need um, for your project to, to take place. Um, and if it, if it can respond to what's going on in the, in the, in the sector at the time, then um, obviously it's going to have um, better um, kind of um, chance over, um, projects that don't meet that as well so again it's it, it's it's harking back to those those fundamental things that I talked to talk to spoke to at the beginning which is um knowing the outcomes um what Rosie said but what is it about what is it that you fundamentally want to achieve um yeah so and it and it's 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 a, it's going to be a little way down the line as you can as you can see so um, and with things constantly in flux, um, so. Mm, no easy answer. No, it's not, <laughs> sorry. 
not very clear <laughs> at all. No, that's okay. Um, are there any last questions? I can't see any. So um, in which case, uh, I'd just like to thank all the speakers for um, uh, taking part and sharing um, sharing uh, all their knowledge and experience from the project. Uh, yes, we will be sharing the slides. Um, Becky will send everybody a link to the Diocese of London website and we will put the recording on the website as well. So that will come out shortly along with a feedback questionnaire. So please, can you uh, take some time to uh, fill that out and send it back in because normally I would have a workshop and I would stand at the door like this and not let you out unless you filled it out. Um, but I can't do that this time. So um, if you could please take some time, that would be fantastic. Anyway, um, thank you all very much um, for coming. I hope you found it useful and we do have our final workshop in November. So um, hopefully see some of you then. Thank you very much. Bye.